Welcome to our evening service. 
We have quite the spread before us tonight, and so we're looking forward to seeing Brother Wilson demonstrating our Passover. Let's all stand together. Page number 365. 365, only a sinner. Not have I gotten on that first. Not have I gotten but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by once I was foolish and sin ruled my heart, causing my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus has found me happy, my case. I now am a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Tears unavailing, no merit had I. Mercy had saved me, or else I must die. Sin had alarmed me, fearing God's face. But now I'm a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows, loving a Savior to tell what he knows. Once more to tell it, would I embrace? I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner. It's great singing this evening, and it's so glad to see each of you here tonight, and looking forward to uh, a good service tonight. going to be a little bit different than uh, uh, our normal Sunday night service, but I think you're really going to enjoy uh, what we have prepared for you tonight, or what, may I should say what Brother Wilson has prepared for you tonight, and uh, I think it's going to be a tremendous blessing, and even uh, I think as you uh, read scripture, uh, you'll, it will become more alive to you as well in some areas, and so uh, looking forward to that, and of course, want to welcome those joining us via live stream as well, and uh, so glad that you're able to join us tonight. Uh, we're going to be trying to do a few things a little bit different because uh, we have so many things up here. Uh, we're going to try, and I'm not sure it, we're going to test it out. Hopefully it'll work, but we are going to try to show uh, closer ups on the screens as he is uh, presenting some things because obviously some things are smaller up here and you know you get three rows back, four rows back to the very back and it's a little bit harder to see uh, what he's showing and things. So we're going to try uh, as best we can so uh, just bear with us on that. Of course those joining us via live stream as well uh, we'll try to show some things a little bit closer you can see what's going on but uh, just really looking forward to tonight and so let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come, uh, Lord, tonight, again, just to worship you, but, uh, Lord, as we sing praises to you, as we think of, uh, Lord, that, that song, we were sinners, uh, but, Lord, thankfully, because of the grace of God and putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you're willing to save us from our sins, and just as Brother Wilson mentioned this morning, uh, Lord, you could have easily just walked away, and, uh, but yet your heart is so full of love toward those of us who are sinners who walked away from you. And yet you willingly sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And, and Lord, even tonight, as, as we go through this Passover uh, supper that they, the Jews uh, do every year, uh, just showing a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so, Father, I ask that you would just uh, bless tonight through it all. And, uh, Lord, that you would just be honored and glorified 
And uh, just uh, as we just look to you, may we love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 The next song, 281, Calvary's Blood. I carried a burden, a staggering weight, and struggled for freedom but could not escape. I trembled and cried at the thought of my fate. What must I do to be saved? I desperately searched for release from my pain, but found that man's wisdom was useless and vain. Is there not a power that can break every chain? What must I do to be saved? Jesus' blood flows from Calvary. for his stain. The men standing by were all mocking his name. But then, yes, I heard it. He called out my name. Kneel at the cross and be saved. I fell at the feet of the one hanging there. Oh, Savior, forgive me. I cried in despair. My burden fell off. Jesus answered my prayer. Kneel at the cross and be saved. Amen. That's a great song to sing as we think about what we're going to be looking at here in a few minutes. And uh, so that's great. Just let me give you a couple of uh, quick announcements here, and then we'll have our ushers come and take up our offering uh, this evening. Uh, of course, again, don't forget, uh, tomorrow is the last day to get registered for uh, the Valentine's Banquet. So if you're interested in coming to the Valentine's Banquet this Friday, uh, February 9th, uh, at 6.30, we're going to have a great evening. Uh, Pastor Pete Davison from Ohio, uh, Dayton it will be coming over, he and his wife, and we'll have a great meal and some fun as well. So, um, again, if you're wanting to get registered for that, please do that by tomorrow, um, and that way we can make sure to turn in uh, how many people are going to be there for food and stuff. Um, and then also this Saturday, we have our men's Bible and breakfast, so we want to encourage all of the men to come out at 9 o'clock. And we have a great time of fellowship and time in the Word of God together and praying for one another. And so uh, that's for all the men, young men, come out for that this Saturday at 9 o'clock. Um, and then also uh, something new. We mentioned that we're starting uh, February 11th, which is this Sunday. And uh, I don't know, you are all just tremendously uh, blessed this morning because uh, that was probably the one and only time that you'll ever see me in an announcement video. <laughs> <laughs> They kind of, they're like, Pastor, you guys are starting the center point class. You got you to do an announcement video about that. And I was like, I'm just, I'm standing right here. Why do I need to be up there too, you know? And, uh, but, so uh, we are starting the center point Sunday school class. That's for the 30s and 40s. If you're in your 30s and 40s, uh, that will be coming up this Sunday, February 11th. And uh, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall. And so make sure you're there. Uh, come a little bit early. Uh, get a great seat. We'll have some uh, coffee, maybe a few donuts there as well. And so uh, make sure you come for that uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, and then next Tuesday, the 13th, don't forget about Ladies of Faith. And so encourage all the ladies, young ladies to come for that uh, as well. 
Uh, and then, of course, also don't forget about our marriage retreat coming up March 15th and 16th. Uh, I'm so excited about having uh, Brother Dave and Bethley Young uh, again with us. Uh, we had them two years ago, and just a tremendous job uh, in our marriage retreat. And so they'll be coming again for the marriage retreat. Uh, but then also, that also kicks off our revival, our spring revival. And so uh, Dr. Young will be doing that uh, as well. And so looking forward to that. But again, you do need to register for that uh, by February the 14th. And uh, the, the total cost, if you're staying at the hotel, is $160. That's for the hotel. Uh, that's for the conference and everything. Now, if you're not staying at the hotel, that's fine. Uh, and that's only $60. And so if you uh, don't want to stay, you just want to travel back and forth. But uh, if you're wanting to stay there at the hotel, uh, the whole cost is $160. But we do need you to uh, get registered with a $60 deposit by February 14th. And that way we can make sure to know how many rooms and things we'll be needing uh, for the conference uh, that week as well. All right. Um, well, let's go ahead and have our ushers come this evening. We'll take up our offering tonight. And uh, again, just being faithful and giving back to the Lord as he is blessed. And uh, so let's take, have our ushers come this evening. And uh, Brother Jay, um, actually, you know what? There's no mic up here. <laughs> I'll pray. All right, I'll pray, okay? You say, well, why don't you just have Brother Jay pray anyway? Be, well, because we do live stream, uh, folks on live stream, when it goes... Yeah, that's exactly how they feel, right? They're like, <laughs> we see them talking, or mouths are moving, but we don't hear anything. So, uh, so I'll pray, and uh, we'll take up our offering this evening. Father, we do thank you, uh, Lord, again, just that we can come this evening and give back to you as you have... Uh, Lord, given so, so willingly and, and blessed so much, Lord, just through your Son, and offering salvation, but then, Lord, even through uh, all the different blessings that you've given. And so, Father, we're just so thankful uh, for what you've done in our lives, and we ask that you would just bless tonight in the service again. Lord, just bless the offering and use it for the cause of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, we're going to kind of normally at this time is when we'd go through our missionaries of the week and the country of the week, and then we'd have our kids uh, come up and say verses. But uh, we want to give as much time for Brother Wilson this evening. And so, uh, again, if you have the bulletin there, the missionaries of the week and the country of the week are there in the bulletin. Uh, you can look at those. If you need a bulletin, they're back there on the table. Um, I believe uh, the missionaries also sent videos, and normally we'd show those in the service, but we will post those to the uh, church uh, private page, and so you can be looking for that tomorrow. Uh, we'll put those videos up uh, that they gave just to get a little bit of a report about what the Lord's doing in their ministries. And, uh, and kids, if you, if you had a verse tonight, just keep it for next Sunday night, all right? And in fact, I heard in Super Church, uh, the kids learned a really great verse. They even put hand motions to it and everything, and I think uh, next week they're going to kind of come up and try to do it all together. And I said, I don't have a problem with that as long as the teachers do it with them. And you know what the teacher said? We'll do it. I'm like, these are awesome teachers. I mean, that's just, I'm thinking maybe we should just have the teachers do it and not the kids. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Amen. Brother Wilson, you come and uh, looking forward to tonight. Uh, I know it'll be a tremendous blessing, but sure appreciate you being with us this weekend. And uh, God bless you, brother. Thank you, sir. It is such a blessing to be here with you all this evening. Uh, be with you here all week. I've enjoyed it 
not all week, I guess it's only a weekend. I feel like I've been here for a long time. You folks make me feel right at home. Uh, and really all of you do, in spite of the fact that maybe one person makes me feel more at home than others. Uh, no, I've just had this weird thing all week because in my Sunday school class every week, Miss Mindy Bush is there. And, and Jeff and Mindy are dear friends. And uh, I keep having to remember that Mrs. Stensis isn't Mrs. Bush, okay? <laughs> It, I just look over and there's one of our friends. And so it's like, but it's not, excuse me. I know that's, that's I don't know, that's gotta be deeply troubling for the people who are the twins, that people do that. On the other hand, she's gotta be used to it and find it humorous perhaps, I don't know. Um, so you've met my friends, my, 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 my Gentile twin, his name is Sam. My name is Shmuel. Shmuel is Hebrew for Sam, Samuel, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm Shmuel. I'm, I'm going to pretend to be the Jewish brother. Um, before we get into anything we're going to do up here tonight, there's, there's two or three things I, I want to mention to you that perhaps will be of interest to you. First thing is, there's a sheet that looks like this on my display. It's called Five Prophecies. This sheet covers the five prophecies in part three of this morning's message. Remember, we did the, the prophecies of the Messiah. Was, these are the five prophecies. And I carry one of these in my Bible all the time. I don't really know why, because it's really simple, and I've got it committed to memory. But, but it's handy to have in case anybody wants it. Grab one of those. You can carry that in your Bible. That might be useful to you. The other thing that I want to mention is that <coughs> uh, I have Passover tracts. Uh, in fact, there are both Purim tracks and Passover tracks on my display. Uh, the next two holidays coming up are Purim and Passover. Those tracks are on my display. I hope that you'll grab some. You know what? Grab, get at least one of each, a Purim and a Passover. You say, well, I don't even know any Jewish people. Okay, but you're going to be praying for God to send you a Jewish person, right? And so you need to be ready for when he sends him. So get one so you'll be ready to witness when, when you run into the Jewish person. The third thing, the third resource I want to tell you about is not a resource that I brought, but it's Brother Dennis. Uh, one of the members of your church, Dennis, he lived, we were talking earlier today, he's Dennis and I'm Mr. Wilson. We won't even go there. Uh, so, he, when he was a young man, he spent a year living in the home of an Orthodox Jewish family in Pittsburgh. Uh, he rented, I guess, an apartment on the third floor of their home and, and became very well acquainted with them and has a wealth of, of experience and, and information about the Jewish people. You really ought to talk to him. I think you would find it extremely interesting. Um, we're going to talk about Passover this evening. Passover is coming up in March, uh, and Passover is... The, the two most important holidays of the year are Passover in the spring and then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in the fall. Uh, these are the biggest holidays that they have. And, I mean, many of the holidays are important, but these are the bigs. This, the Passover is a very, very important thing. Uh, if, if nominal Christians go to church on, on Christmas and Easter, nominal Jews go to the synagogue on Passover and Yom Kippur. Uh, these are the two days that anybody's going to go to. And Jewish people who are not religious at all, still most of them will celebrate Passover. It's a very important time in their culture. Now, there's a lot of different parts to Passover, but what we're doing tonight is the Passover dinner. This, they call it a Seder. That's S-E-D-E-R, the Passover Seder. And that's what we'll be doing tonight. Now, this is a little bit misleading in that the Seder is not done it's not led by the rabbi in the synagogue. It's led by dad at home with his family, okay? And so let's just pretend for this evening that I'm dad and that you're my kids, okay? And we've all gathered together to do the Seder. Now, if we were really doing the Seder, you're gonna have a long table and the place setting that I have up here, each, each person in the room is gonna have their own place setting. Okay, tonight only I get a place setting, but normally each one of us would. Now, I want to show you this. Um, oh, great. Can you guys shoot in on this? This would be fantastic if you could. And so this is the Seder plate. Uh, at the top it says Pesach, which means Passover. Um, and uh, are they able to shoot in? I don't know if they... Look at there, those guys. And there are several elements. You have, uh, you have the zeroya, the shank bone of a lamb. 
Uh, although if they don't have a lamb bone handy, they might use chicken. Uh, you have the bitza, that's a boiled egg. Uh, you have the bitter herbs, that's horseradish, and that will light you up. Um, then there's, there's two kinds of greens. Uh, th this is called the carpus, and actually it's, it's either parsley or the leafy part of the celery, okay? And this over here is the chazeret, it's romaine. And, and then here we have this goopy stuff that's a uh, haroset. Anyway, that's what those are, and we'll talk more about those as we go through. But I wanted you to be able to see what this, let me see, yeah, there you go, so you can get a look at it, at what it is. These are the different, some of the different elements that take place during the Passover. Um, we have matzo. This is unleavened bread. Uh, it's sort of like a large cracker, okay? And, and so we use a lot of matzo. And they use wine. We are Baptists. We use, this is officially Jewish grape juice, okay? The Kedem grape juice, and it's kosher, and it's gluten-free, for those of you who are worried about that. Anyway, so, uh, so, so we have, and it's grape juice, because I, Brian was really worried about whether or not it was, whether, whether or not I had it. He, he was questioning me about that. Okay, now, yesterday I was explaining that whenever there's a holiday, it gives you an opportunity to witness. Okay, and I said that what you're going to do then is you're going to go to your Jewish neighbor's door and you're going to have a treat in one hand. You're going to, so you went to the back table and you signed up for the light bearer's letter. And so Brother Sam's going to send you a letter and say, such and such a date next week, there's going to be a holiday. And I'm going to tell you three things. I'm going to tell you where this holiday came from, how Jewish people celebrate it, and how to use it to witness. Okay, and so I'll be sending that out to you if you signed up for it. And so... You're going to get the light bearer's letter. You're going to know, okay, holiday coming up, and then you're going to be prepared. You're going to go to the store, and you're going to get a Passover card or whatever card for the particular holiday. You're going to get a gospel track. There's a selection of tracks being sent to your church right now. Uh, and you're going to buy the treat. Now, for Passover, Passover is, is uh, allied in the Jewish world with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's very, very important that there's no leaven in the home. Now, the weird thing is, is we think of leaven, oh, well, that's yeast, that's what you put in bread. The truth of the matter is, it turns out that there's leaven in just about everything you can eat. Not everything, but tons of stuff have leaven that you would never have guessed. And almost no dessert in the world can be made without some kind of leaven, except coconut macaroons have no leaven in them. And so as a result, a coconut macaroon, these are chocolate coconut macaroons, are the, the, the typical treat, the typical dessert for Passover. So I'm going to show up at my Jewish neighbor's door, knock, 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 he's going to come to the door, and I'm going to say, Chag Sameach Pesach. Or if I want to, I can just say, Happy Passover. And he's going to look at me in shock and say, You're not Jewish, are you? And I'm like, No, I'm a Baptist. And they're like, Well, what are you doing here? Well, it's Passover. Well, yeah, it is. How did you know? I said, Well, I read the Bible. I'm up on these things. And, and he'll be like, that is amazing. And I'll say, by the way, I, I got you this card from our family to your family. And he'll, he'll take it and he'll say, you got us a Passover. You got us a Passover. What a kind thing for you. Well, what is this here? Oh, it's a paper that's about Passover. It's a paper that's about Passover in the gospel. Uh, and and, and I, I thought you'd enjoy reading it. He's like, that is so thoughtful for it, of you. By the way, I brought some macaroons as a Passover drink. You brought macaroons? That is so kind. And then I'm going to ask him the questions. How does your family celebrate Passover? And he's going to tell me. And I'm going to listen carefully because God is teaching me things and showing me how to reach him. And then I'm going to say, what does Passover mean to you? And he's going to tell me. And then I'm going to say, can I tell you what Passover, what my favorite part of Passover is? And he's going to be, sure. And then I'm going to tell him about Jesus the Messiah. And so here's the macaroons. Here's the card in the track. That's how you do it. Hope you guys will all do that as Passover's coming. And there are three, six, nine. There's a dozen macaroons here. First dozen people get them. Okay. After the service, stay where you're at. Okay. Um, now, I'm wearing a yarmulke. It's actually, in, in, in Yiddish, it's called a yarmulke. In Hebrew, it's called a kippah. And a talit, a prayer shawl. And so... Uh, I'm doing that because I'm representing the Jewish person who's doing this. Uh, the, the Seder is a ceremonial meal that's meant to commemorate Passover. And you folks know the story of Passover, how, how God wonderfully delivered 
my people, the Jewish people, from bondage in Egypt and led them to freedom. Um, one of the things that we'll find is that young people and children play a very important role in the Passover, and that will be true this evening as well. Somebody might very well ask, why do we care? We're Baptists, we're not Jewish. Why do we want to take a whole service and talk about the Jewish Passover? Well, two reasons. Number one is the Passover is in the scriptures. It wasn't their idea, it was God's idea. Okay, And so for us to know more about the, the Passover will help fill up our, our, our knowledge of the scriptures. That's good. But I'll be honest, that's not the primary reason I'm here. The reason that I'm here is that there's all sorts of stuff in the Passover that are beautiful pictures of Jesus Christ. And we can use the Passover to share Messiah with our Jewish neighbors. And so I want to show you those things so that then when you show up at your neighbor's door, you'll be able to share with him how Passover speaks to him of Jesus Christ. The Passover, as it's really done in a Jewish home, the, the Jewish dad does not have all the details of the Passover memorized, okay? He has a book on the table called an Agadah. And, and he will go through the Agadah, and it's basically an instruction book that step by step leads him through the entire procedure, okay? It will take all evening long, They'll start at sundown, and then it'll go till late in the evening. Pastors asked me to do an abbreviated version of it. Okay, we're not going to take all evening long. We're going to hit the high spot. So we're not going to go over every detail. However, I've worked very hard to make sure that the things that I'm teaching you tonight are, are very, uh, they're very apropos. They're, they are what the Jewish people do. Now, before we even get to the Passover, there was an enormous amount of preparation, okay, because... I said there can be no leaven in the, in, the, in the home. Passover happens in the spring. And before Passover, mom and the kids go on a cleaning spree. They go from the house top to bottom, every nook, every cranny. They are going in there and they do this great cleaning. Any leaven has to be removed from the house. Okay? If you own a Jewish business, all leaven has to be removed from your business. Okay? Uh, if you're a grocer, all leaven has to be removed from your stores. Uh, it, it, it's incredible the links they go to. Every bit of leaven has to be removed, and they do a top-to-bottom cleaning. Some people believe that the whole concept of spring cleaning comes from the Jewish people at Passover doing the stem-to-stern cleaning of the home uh, in preparation for the Passover. Now, it's kind of funny because the mom and the kids clean the house so it's perfectly clean, except they leave one little pile of dust and dirt somewhere in the house because dad comes home and he's going to inspect the house to make sure that it is perfectly certifiably clean of leaven. And so he will go and traditionally he will carry a candle, a spoon, and a feather. Really? And with the candle, he will look into every dark corner looking to make sure the place has been appropriately cleaned and there's no leaven in the house. And eventually, as he does his investigation, he will find that part that mom purposely left there. And he'll say, aha, it's only like this much. And so he'll take the spoon and using it as a dustpan and the feather as using it as a broom, he will sweep that little bit of, of dirt or leaven or whatever she left into the spoon. And then they will march out of the house and they'll have a little fire going and they will burn the leaven in the fire and the house will be declared completely devoid of all leaven and then we can begin, okay? Now the other thing is that mom has been working furiously and has cooked this huge feast. Passover is their great, greatest feast of the year, like, like Thanksgiving for us. They're gonna have a great big meal with no leaven, which really hurts the meal. Uh, but nonetheless, that's their big meal. And so there's a big meal coming tonight in the way that we go. And so now we are prepared for the Passover and it's time to start it. But interestingly, though I am, as, though dad is supposed to lead the Passover, dad is unable to begin the Passover. The, 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 the Passover can only begin when mom comes and lights the Passover candles. And so we've asked Ms. Stensus as if she would come and play the role of the Jewish mom coming to light the Passover candles. She's going to light the candles 
and then she's going to pray the prayer. And she's going to say, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushano Bemitzvatav, Vitzivano Lehadlik Nishel Yom Tov. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to kindle the festival lights. Excellent. Now, it's really interesting because I'm telling you there's all sorts of places, there's all sorts of symbols and, and shadows of the gospel here. The rabbis say that without a woman to bring light, the story of redemption cannot begin. How many of you would agree with that? Without a woman, a Jewish lady, to bring the light, without Mary, to give birth to the light of the world, the story of redemption can't begin. And that's true. And we see it in the Passover, that without a woman to bring the light, the story of redemption cannot begin. And then Dad is going to read the story of the Passover. And so we have asked Pastor, if he would, to read Exodus 12, 1 through 14. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus ye shall eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses whereof ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Thank you so much. And so we see here in the scriptures the story of the Passover. And I'm not going to go into great detail about the story because I believe that you already know the story. The people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt and the Egyptians were destroying them. And God sent Moses to say, let my people go. And Pharaoh said no. And God sent the ten plagues. The tenth was the death of the firstborn. But God told the people of Israel, take that lamb. It's very interesting. It was a lamb. It was a male lamb. It was a perfect lamb. It was a lamb of the first year. This lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ. We remember in, in, in John, when, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he said, Behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I often think that if John was talking to a bunch of Americans and he said to a bunch of Americans, behold the Lamb of God, he points at Jesus and says, behold the Lamb of God, the Americans would say, uh, John, John, that's not a lamb. That's a guy. That's, that's a man. That's a, that's a person. It's not a lamb. God. It's, it's, it's a person. But the, he wasn't talking to a bunch of Americans. He's talking to a bunch of Jews. The Jewish people know what a lamb is for. It's a sacrifice for sin. And we said, behold, look, the Lamb of God pointing at Jesus. They looked at Jesus and they're like, hold it. He's, a lamb. He's going to be a sacrifice for sin. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And they understood. The Lamb 
here in Passover. In fact, it, it even says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. In 1 Corinthians, it compares Jesus Christ to the Passover lamb. And he was a lamb. He was a perfect lamb. He was a male. And he was sacrificed. Just as that lamb back in that day was sacrificed. And that lamb's blood was poured out just as Jesus' blood was poured out. And that, that blood had to be applied to the doorpost just as Jesus' blood has to be applied to our hearts by faith. And so the lamb is a perfect and beautiful symbol of Jesus Christ. I was, <clears throat> it's been three years ago or so, I was at my son's house in North Carolina, um, and I knew that I was going to be doing a, a Seder just like this at a church, and I said, you know what, I don't have a bone, I need a, I need a bone. And uh, I, said to him, I said to my son, I said, do you, know, do you have a meat market here? And he said, well, there's one up in the next town. And so I called up there and I said, hey, do you guys, do you guys carry lamb? And they said, yeah, we have lamb. And I said, I'll be right there. So I jumped in the car and I drove over there. And I walked in the door and there, there wasn't anybody in the store, just the, the butcher was there. And he came to the counter. He's wearing one of those white aprons that had all that kind of like gross, messy stuff on it. And, uh, and I walked up to him. I said, hello. And he said, hi. And I said, I called a little while ago. And he said, okay. And I said, so you have lamb? He said, yeah, we have lamb. What, 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 you, what, you're looking for lamb chops? What do you need? And I said, well, I have a really strange request. I said, I'm not actually looking for the meat. And he's like, you know, this is a meat market, right? And I said, I'm looking for a bone. And he said, well, you got a dog? And I said, no. No, I said, I need a specific bone. I need the leg bone of a lamb. And the butcher in North Carolina said, oh, you must be going to do a Passover Seder. And now it was my turn to be surprised. I said, I didn't think you'd even know the word Passover Seder. And he said, and why not? I'm Jewish. <laughs> I was shocked. In this little town in North Carolina, the butcher was a Jewish guy. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no. And he said, he said so you're Jewish. I said, no, I'm a Baptist preacher. And he said, <laughs> that was his turn to be surprised. And he said, why is a Baptist preacher doing a Passover Seder? And I said, because we love the Jewish people. And I want our people to know about your holiday. I, I want them to be aware of it. And he said, that's wonderful. And I asked, I asked the butcher, I said, tell me, what's your favorite part of the, of the Seder? And he said, oh, I love the afikoman. You'll know what that is in a few minutes. And usually that's what they say. They say, I love the afikoman. And we talked for a few minutes about the afikoman. And I said, yeah, that's a marvelous part of it. I love that part of it. I said, you want to know my favorite part? And he said, no, what's your favorite part? And I said, well, you know the story how that the people were in slavery and they were perishing and they had no way of escape. They had no power to escape from their situation. He said, yeah. I said, and then God sent a deliverer and a lamb had to be killed and the blood had to be shed and it had to be applied to the doors. And he said, well, yeah, that's, that's the story. That's Passover. That's, that's our story. And I said, I'm in that story. He said, what? I said, I'm in your story. And he said, I don't understand. What do you mean? And I said, because I was also in bondage. Not to the Egyptians. I was in bondage to sin, and I had no way to escape. But God sent a deliverer. He sent Mashiach. He sent the Messiah. And he came to earth. And just as the Passover lamb's blood was shed, his blood was shed when he died on the cross. And just as the blood has to be applied through faith, I've applied it to my heart. And so now I know that when the day of judgment comes, when death comes, or when the Lord returns, when he comes past me, he will see the blood and he will pass over me. And the Jewish butcher looked at me and he said, I have never heard anything like that before. That's really interesting. He didn't get saved that day, but he heard the gospel. And so the easiest way to share Christ at the time of the Passover is the Passover lamb. It's obvious. It's, it's, you, you can't come up with a more obvious symbol. And so I ask you to do that. Now, we say that in the Passover, there are four cups. Now, I thought actually when I first started this that you had to have four cups. And it, it, you only have one cup. 
Okay, each person has one cup, but it's filled four times, and it's, you have to fill it and drink four times with the, did I specify, grape juice, juice, juice. Okay, so, so we have the grape juice, and there are four cups, and each one is a symbol, and it has special meaning. My wife will be so glad that I slopped some of the juice on the tablecloth. And so everyone at the, in, in the home would fill the, the first cup with the juice. Now, the first cup is called the cup of sanctification. Now, to sanctify means to set apart. And all of these are taken from a passage of Scripture in, Je- in Exodus chapter 6. And, and one of them in the cup, and, and there are different phrases in Exodus 6, 6, and 7. There are four different phrases that are taken out that symbolize these cups. So the first cup is the cup of sanctification. And it says here, Wherefore say unto the the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And it says, look, God said he would bring us out, that he would separate us out from the Egyptians. And to to be made separate is to be made sanctified. And so they say the first cup is the cup of separation. So everyone would, would pour their cup and then there would be the special speech. There's always a special speech. And then there would be a prayer. Uh, they would talk about how God had separated them out, had called Israel to be a special people unto his own. And then they would pray the prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei piri ha-gefen. Which means, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, king of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. And then everybody would drink the first cup the cup of sanctification. When that's done, there's a hand washing. Now you say, didn't you wash your hands before you came to the table? We're not even talking about that. This is a ceremonial thing. It's not like soap and water type of a thing. It's a ceremonial thing that they would do, and I'm going to frankly just skip right past it because for the sake of time, okay? Then we come to the carpus. Now, the carpus is, is this stuff right here uh, in this thing. This is the carpus, and as I told you before, it's going to be either parsley or it's going to be the leafy part of the celery. And so you have the carpus there. Now, what is the point of the carpus? The, the, the Jewish people say that the carpus, okay, Passover happens in the spring. Okay, we're in Ohio, and so this is really vivid. Everything is cold. All the trees appear to be dead. There's no crops in the field. The world seems to be dead. But come in spring, everything's going to burst out green and lush and beautiful. And there's going to be new life springing up everywhere. And and the Jewish people say Passover happens in the spring, and it reminds us of new life, just as the people of Israel left the winter of bondage and went into the spring of freedom. Passover happens in the spring, and it reminds us of that. And so they take the carpus, and the green leafy carpus reminds us of new life. And so it's a symbol of the new life. And yet we have a bowl here with salt water in it. The salt water symbolizes our tears because we have suffered horribly in bondage while we were in Egypt. And so are we going to enjoy the carpus? Yes, but it's got to be tempered with the salt water of our tears. Because in life, there's tears, but after the tears, there's new life. And so we would, every person at the table would dip, to take the carpus, dip it in the salt water to remind them of new life, but of the sorrow and the suffering that they've been through. And they would eat the carpus. And so that's that. Now, the next thing is they would take this thing here. Now, I need to explain this, what this is. This is a matzotash. Um, A matzotash, matzo is the unleavened bread, and tash means like pocket. Okay? So this is a thing that's made of fabric, and I don't know that you can see it from here, but it has three pockets. There's pocket one, pocket two, and pocket three. And in each of these pockets, there is a piece, if I can find my way into there, of unleavened bread. And so we're going to bring out one of the pieces of unleavened bread. 
Now, it's very important. Excuse me. Carpus. <clears throat> it's very specific that we have to take the second one. There's three pockets, and there's three pieces of matzo in the, the matzo tosh. Okay? And, and so it's very specific. We don't take it from the first pocket or from the third pocket. We have to take the, the, the piece of matzo from the second pocket. Okay? And, and we bring it out, and, and we're going to do something that we call the athakoman. Okay? Now, I want to talk to you for a moment. They wouldn't talk long about the matzo, but I'm going to talk for a minute about the matzo. The matzo is unleavened bread. Because when they left out of Egypt, they took unleavened bread. There's really two things about unleavened bread. One is that it's considered to be very plain. Now, maybe it seems like a novelty to you to eat the unleavened bread, but if you had to do it for eight days during Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you'd find out it gets really boring really quick, okay? And you just really look for the day when the holiday is over and you can eat real bread, okay? This isn't great bread. And so unleavened bread symbolizes their, 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 their time of slavery in that it's, it's the bread of affliction, but also because... To make regular bread, it takes time for it to rise. And when they left out of Egypt, they left in great haste, and there wasn't time for the bread to rise. And so that's why unleavened bread is associated with this. The other thing is, is that leaven is a symbol of sin in the scriptures. And this bread doesn't have any leaven in it. Okay? And so what I want to talk to you about, first of all, is for us as Christians, when we see the unleavened bread, it makes, it makes us think, of Jesus the Messiah. You say, well, why would it? Well, first of all, he said, I am the bread of life. Okay? Because bread is that which has given us strength and sustains our life, and Jesus Christ is that which gives us strength and sustains our life. He is the life-giving bread of life. Not only that, but Jesus Christ had no leaven of sin in him. No leaven, no sin. He was the sinless bread of life. Now, I want to look at this for a minute. Let's press a point a little bit. Can you see the holes in the unleavened bread? It's pierced with many holes. And the Bible says that they will look upon him whom they've pierced. And can you see the lines, the stripes? And the Bible says with his stripes we, we are healed. Okay? And so the unleavened bread is a beautiful symbol of Jesus' Messiah. I just want to say that to start with. The Jewish people wouldn't think of it that way, but we certainly see that in it. Now, in the Jewish Seder, at this point, Dad is going to bring out the second piece of unleavened bread. He's going to take it, and he's going to break it. He's going to take the, the, the smaller half of the break and put it back where it belongs. But this larger half, he's going to take, and this half is called the afikomen, A-F-I-K-O-M-E-N, the afikomen. So he's going to take the afikomen, and he's going to wrap it up in this napkin. And then he's going to call for Brother Joel. And Brother Joel is going to take the afikoman and go hide it in the other room. And that's what they do. They take the second piece of bread, break it, wrap it in the napkin, and then it's taken and it's hidden away in another part. And we forget about it because then we're going to go on with the ceremony. Okay, we're going to come back to it later. Later, kids, all of you kids that are here, this is going to be a balagan. Balagan, Hebrew, actually it's from the Russian, uh, but it's a word that's used in Israel. It means big, crazy mess. Okay. In a little while, all the kids have the opportunity to go find the afikoman. And whoever finds it will be rich beyond measure. Gold. Gold! No, it's... Oh, it's better. It's chocolate. Chocolate gold coins. Okay? And so whoever finds it gets the prize. Okay? And so then we'll have a time later on in the evening when the kids will go racing out of here looking for the afikoman 
Yeah, they really do this. I'm telling you, that's why the butcher said my favorite part is the afikoman. When I was a kid, I always loved going and looking, and sometimes I'd find it. I was so excited. And, and so the kids will go roaring out of here, find the afikoman. One of them will find it, and he'll come back in victoriously, waving the afikoman, and then I will have to redeem it. I'll have to buy it back. I'll have to trade him gold for the afikoman. And then the rule is, is that the afikoman has to be partaken that everyone present has to eat a piece of the afikoman. Can I go back through the story again? Do you already see it all? So it's bread, as Jesus is the bread of life. It's not from the first pocket or the third pocket. It's from the second pocket of the, of the, of the matzatash because Jesus Christ is the second person of the, person of the Trinity. So it's from the second pocket. And it's taken out and it's broken as his body was broken for us. And then it's wrapped in the cloth as his body was enwrapped in grave cloths. And then it's taken to another place and hidden out of sight as his body was taken and hidden in the tomb. Symbolically, it's buried. But then later in the evening, it's going to wonderfully reappear, just as Jesus three days later wonderfully re reappeared when he was resurrected. And then everyone has to partake. Everyone has to receive him, just as we all have to receive Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Um, the the Afikoman is the most beautiful picture of, of Jesus Messiah, of redemption, of salvation that, that you could think of. Literally, if you sat down and said, let me see, I think I'm going to try to pick, figure out a symbol of the gospel to put in a Jewish ceremony, you couldn't have come up with something this good. This is just, it's, it's, and literally every year around the world, religious Jewish families gather together and celebrate their Passover Seder and they, they act out what we're doing, they reenact the gospel, the redemption in Jesus Christ every year, not realizing what they're doing. Oh, I got one more, I've got to tell you one more thing. Afikoman, most of these words I'm using here today, all these weird words you've never heard before, they're Hebrew words. Except for Afikoman isn't. It's Greek. It's like, how did a Greek word get into a Hebrew ceremony? Nobody knows. It's a great mystery. Nobody knows how a Greek word got into their ceremony, but it's a Greek word. If you ask the rabbis, what does afikoman mean? They say, well, you know, we eat the afikoman after we eat our big meal, so probably it means dessert because that's what you have after a big meal. Okay, two things. Number one, come on, unleavened bread is not dessert. I'm just telling you. Okay, and second of all, it doesn't mean that. What does afikoman mean? Greek scholars tell us that afikoman means, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. And so the second person of the Trinity, the bread of life, his body broken, wrapped in grave cloths, buried, resurrected. Everybody has to receive him and the promise of his return. Enacted by Jewish families around the world every year without them understanding what they're doing. Do you think you could witness with that? Do you think you could share the gospel through the afikoman, through their own stuff? It's, it's my favorite thing. I, I, I love it. Okay, and so the, the, the dad is going to take the matzo and say the matzo is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. And this is a place that I really like. I think it's beautiful. I mentioned earlier, yesterday or today, I don't recall when, that Jewish people generally are very nice people. Now, there's some ornery Jewish people, just like there's some ornery every kind of people. But as, as I would tell you from my experience, as Dennis would tell you from his experience, most of the Jewish people are very, very kind people. And one of the reasons is that they've suffered. And at this point, when they're talking about the matzo, they're talking about it's the bread of affliction. There is a time when the dad says, we say to the afflicted, if there's anyone who is needy, if there's anyone who's hungry, we invite you to come and to join us at our Passover table. 
And literally, if they know somebody who's needy, who's, who's hungry, who doesn't have someone to celebrate with, they will literally invite them in to take part because they have suffered and they understand that. We know you're suffering. We want to help. We invite you to take part. And then the next part is we have the four questions. And that one of the sons will be designated to ask the four questions. Now, it's not four random questions. There are four questions that are asked, same four questions with the same four answers every year for a thousand years. And so I would like James. James, where did I say? There you are. Yeah. Um, so one of the sons, this is my son, James. Uh, so one of the sons is going to come and he's going to ask the four questions. The reason that we eat matzo on this night is because we are celebrating our peoples going forth from slavery to freedom. We eat matzo because our fathers had to leave Egypt very quickly and there was no time for the bread to rise. On all other nights, we eat vegetables and herb, or herbs of all kind. Why on this night do we eat bitter herbs especially? The bitter herbs that we eat on Passover night remind us that our fathers were slaves in Egypt and that their lives were very bitter. We dip the parsley in the salt water to remind us that life blooms again in the spring. We dip the maror, the bitter herbs, in the sweet haroset as a sign of hope. Even in their bitter suffering, their lives were sweetened by the hope of freedom. On all other nights, everyone sits straight up at the table. Why on this night do we all recline? Now, there's something that's inaccurate about the way I'm doing the, the Passover because it's much easier to teach you. But in a real Passover... Back in the day, okay, do you ever notice that it said that they, that they lay at the table? Uh, in the scriptures, it talks about they didn't sit up, okay, they didn't stand like I'm standing, and they didn't even sit up as we sit up. Literally, they had couches next to the table. The tables were very low, and people would recline and eat, okay? And that's how it was done. Now today, because of that, there's supposed to be a pillow here, and I'm supposed to be kind of laying over and leaning on my pillow. But I don't know how to teach that way, so I'm not doing that. Uh, but anyway, so he's saying, why is it that on other nights we all sit up straight? Why do we recline? We recline at the table because in ancient time, only free men could recline at the table. Since our fathers became free on this night, we recline. Thank you, James. Excellent. And so, so one of the sons comes and, and asks the four questions. And again, it's a way of reinforcing to the young people, why are we doing the things that we're doing? Then they would go through the so whole story of the, of the Passover. Now, we've already covered the high points of it, but they would go through it in great detail, which we're not going to do right now, okay? However, then the next thing, uh, I, 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 so this is a time of confession here. I have no musical ability whatsoever. I am like completely musically ungifted. In the Passover, they do music. There's music at different places in it. I can't do music, so I don't do music. Uh, but Pastor has very graciously approved for us to do a song. Now, there's a song named Dayenu, and I'm going to invite you to sing along with the video and sing the Dayenu song. The translation of it is going to be on the screen, so you'll know what you're singing. So let me give you the idea of the Dayenu song. The idea of the Dayenu song, it's a song of great gratitude to God. So for instance, they, and there's many verses, they, you can sing it all night long. Uh, and, and so it's like, if all God had done was to deliver us from slaver, slavery, it would have been enough. The word Dayenu means it would have been enough. But God didn't just deliver us from slavery, he also opened the Red Sea for us so we could cross over on dry ground. And then the next verse would say, if God had just allowed us to cross the, cross the Red Sea on dry ground, Dayenu, it would have been enough. But he didn't do that. He also slew our enemies in the sea. And the next verse would say, and if God had slain our enemies in the sea, Dayenu, it would have been enough. But God didn't just do that. But he fed us manna in the wilderness. 
And it would go on and on and on, recognizing this blessing of God and saying, you know, if that's all he'd done, it would have been enough. But God didn't stop there. He did something more and something more and something more. And so we sing Dayenu to remember that God is so great and God is so loving that he did more for us than we can count. And so if we, do we have the Dayenu song ready to go? Go, let's go Dayenu. Sounds like this. We'll start with the chorus. We just say, Dai, Dai, Enu. Dai, Dai, Enu. Dai, Dai, Enu. Dai, Dai, Enu. Thank you. Actually, yeah, give him a hand. That's a Jewish guy teaching Jewish people how to sing the Dayenu song. And I love the Dayenu song, and, and I think he's a riot. Um, this is the first time in my experience that a pastor has been brave enough to show the Dayenu song in the church. <laughs> give the pastor a big hand. Okay. Okay, so the next, the dad's going to talk about three symbols, three important symbols of the Passover. And he's going to start by talking about the ziroya, the, the shank bone of the lamb. And then he's going to talk about the matzo. I don't know why they do it again, because they've been talking about it all along. And then they're going to talk about the maror, the bitter herbs. So in that order. Now, I'm going to change the order just because I want to. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the matzo again, because I think we've covered the matzo. The bitter herbs is the horseradish that's right here. And, and the horseradish, it's, it's bitter. You guys know what horseradish tastes. It's really bitter. And, and it reminds them of the bitterness of their suffering in slavery in Egypt. Okay, so that's what that's about. But the, the zeroya is what I would like to focus in on right now. This is the bone from a, uh, this is a leg bone from a lamb. Okay, and it is actually the leg bone from a lamb. Okay, this is a shank bone of a lamb. Now, do you remember when Pastor read the... the the chapter in Exodus, where it said that you should take a lamb, a lamb of the first year, a perfect lamb, that it should be killed, that its blood should be poured out and put on the doorpost, that it should be roasted with fire, and that it should be put on the table. The centerpiece of the evening was that roasted lamb. When I'm thinking about that roasted lamb, I have to tell you, my mouth is watering. That sounds delicious. That roasted lamb, roasted with fire, mmm. Boy, that's a little, you know, put a little herbs on that. That would be great, okay? That was the centerpiece of the Passover. So here's my question. Where's the lamb? Something's missing here. There is no lamb. What is Passover without the lamb? I mean, it was all about the lamb. And there's no lamb. This is all that's left of a lamb. Is there anybody here that would really like to chew on this? Anybody want to eat this lamb? Boys, you can't chew on my bone. <laughs> this won't give you any nourishment. The 
the blood from this, there's no blood in this that can be put on the doorposts of the house. The Jewish, if you go back to that day, the centerpiece was the lamb. The blood of the lamb that had been on the doorpost that saved their lives. If you come to today, to our modern day, there's no lamb. There's a bone. Do you know what we do with the bone during the Passover Seder? And nothing at all. What are you going to do with the bone? They at one point hold it up and say, and there's a bone. It reminds us of a lamb. But there's no lamb. And I think that it reminds us of man-made religion. Religions of man. Judaism, which is not the religion of the Old Testament. It's a religion of the rabbis and a rabbi, the rabbinical traditions. It's a religion, and it can save you just as much as this can nourish you. Okay? It doesn't have the power to save. The lamb is missing. And this seems really tragic to me. Where is the lamb, and how is there salvation without a lamb? So they talk about the symbols, the zeroya, the lamb bone, and then they talk about the matzo, the unleavened bread, the maror, the bitter herbs, and then they have the halel. Now the halel, anybody here know the word halel? Actually, you do know the word halel, okay? So let me tell you another word. Uh, I was talking, is there anybody here that's name ends with E-L? Raise your hand real quick, any A-E-Ls? Your name is? Michael. Michael, Michael Daniel, Samuel, Ezekiel, all of the E-L words, the E-L means God, okay? And so Michael means, what does Michael mean? God is my judge? That's Samuel. I don't remember what Michael means, but Michael, it ends with God, and the God is in your name, okay? So Michael, all of those, now how about, how about another thing? In Hebrew, they call, God's name is Yahweh, okay? And you know where you hear that all the time? Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Hezekiah, all of the yas at the ends of many names, that's Yah from Yahweh, from God. And so if there's an E-L or a Yah at the end of your name, that's talking about God. Now, Hallel is a word that you know, but you know it with the Yah at the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise God. The Hallel means praise. Yah means God. So the Hallels, they're going to sing the Hallels. And so what they're going to do is they're going to go to Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. And they're going to read these Psalms and they're going to praise God. Okay? And I will tell you that I want to do that. But for sake of time, I'm just going to read a few verses out of Psalm 114. When Israel went out of Egypt... The house of Jacob from a people of strange language. Judah was his sanctuary. Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams, the little hills like lambs. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back. Ye mountains that ye skipped like rams and little lambs. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. And so they would read psalms to praise God at this point. And then after the Hallel, after the praise, the songs of praise, it's time for the second cup. So again, one cup, but we, we drink from it four times. And so then at that point, everybody would add more juice to their cups all around the table. And they would take the second cup. The second cup is the cup of praise. So we just read the Psalms of praise, and now we have the second cup, the cup of praise, the cup of deliverance. It's based on the, the verse, Exodus 6, 6, where, where God says, I will deliver you out of their bondage. And so they're praising God for deliverance from their bondage. And so again, there would be a little speech about that. Then they would pray the special prayer about that, and then they would drink the second cup. Okay, and then they would wash their hands again because they do that. And then they would have a time of blessing of the, of the matzo. And so they would take it out. Everybody would get a piece of matzo. Uh, 
They would distribute it all out. They would talk about the matzo. They would say a prayer over the matzo, and, and that would be all ready. And then it would be time for the bitter herbs. Now, here's what they would do. They would take a piece of matzo and break off a piece. And then remember when, when my dear son asked me the four questions, and one of them was about dipping. Now, remember earlier we dipped the carpus in the salt water, but now we're going to dip the matzo in the bitter herbs. Okay, so we're going to take the unleavened bread and we're going to dip it in the bitter herbs. I might use a spoon to kind of help out here. And so we're going to kind of get some, some bitter herbs on the matzo. But then also there's this goopy stuff here. This goopy stuff right here is called haroset. And it looks a little scary. And people look at it and they're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to put something like that in my mouth. But trust me, you do. Uh, because haroset is made of shredded apples, uh, and it's got honey and raisins and cinnamon and, and nuts and all kinds of good things in it. And so they take, and they, they take the piece of matzo, they dip it in the bitter herbs, and then they smear the haroset on it, okay? You say, what is the point of all of this? Well, the whole point of it is to say that, that uh, again, it's, it's talking about how in life there is suffering, bitter herbs, but after the suffering comes the sweetness, the haroset. And so each person makes their little, their, their, their piece of matzo with the bitter herbs and the haroset, and then they eat that. It's a very strange taste, because you have something very bitter and something very sweet all together in one. Pardon me. And then they go to the baitza. The baitza is the egg. And there's a good question of, how did an egg get into the pot? Do you remember thinking anything about an egg when you read Exodus? There's no egg in it, but now there's an egg in it. They speculate that the egg was added because there was no lamb. I suppose you needed a little protein somewhere. And so, before the destruction of the temple, people brought and sacrificed a lamb. After 70 AD, they began using roasted meat or an egg to sample, symbolize the lamb. The egg is dipped in the salt water and eaten. Hmm. And some people ask me, they say, Brother Sam, does it make you uncomfortable doing all this eating and drinking in front of all of us? No, it's not bothering me a bit. <laughs> Um, and then was everybody's favorite part because then it was time to have the meal and everybody would sit down around the table and gather around and mom and the daughters would stop bringing food out of the kitchen and they would pile the table high with everything that didn't have leaven in it and they would have a beautiful meal like our Thanksgiving meal, okay? Great big meal until they're all ready to pop and then they're ready to go on. And so we're skipping the meal. Sadly, we don't get the big meal tonight. I think we need to criticize somebody about not getting the big meal. Okay. And then, this is momentous. Okay, he's ready. It's time. All right. And then is the time to search for the afikoman. Now, young people, the first one to bring me the afikoman wins. Go! I love this, this is so fun. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I wanna tell you that Joel was sent back there and deputized to keep them from disassembling the church. Um, <laughs> his job was to make sure they don't destroy everything and perhaps to guide their steps if need be. They're, they're scouring everything. Oh, we have a winner. Stay here, stay here. Oh, you're throwing off a coman all over the room, buddy. Yeah, just pick that off and put it in there. That'd be great. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so what's your, what's your name? Brady. Brady? Yeah. Brady, congratulations. That's very good. Now, Brady, are you willing to give me the afikoman? Hmm? That belongs to you. But I have something else for you. The official. This is just to wear tonight. You have to give it back to me. 
Don't take it home. Somebody else took it home. I'm still mad, okay? <laughs> the Afficoman Finder T-shirt. <laughs> woo -hoo! Put this on, buddy. All right. He is the official Afficoman Finder, and he gets to wear the Afficoman Finder T-shirt till the end of the evening before you leave home. I'll drop that on my display if you would. Thank you. And the chocolate and the gold is all yours. Okay. Excellent. So Brady is our Afficoman finder of the night. Good job. All right. I'm wondering if there was bloodshed back there. <laughs> I think nobody knows. And I think we don't want to. Okay. And so then the Afficoman is brought back. And we unwrap what remains of it. <laughs> and as I said before then, the, everybody present must partake of the Afficoman. And so, go ahead. You can go ahead and eat it. Um, it's, we're, this isn't communion. You don't have to wait. Okay? And uh, there are benefits to sitting in the front row. If you're in the back row, you lose. Okay? I'm not sure how much you lose. And by the way, we're going to run out, guys. However, if you want to, after we're done, you know those little, little things I made with the, the matzo and the bitter herbs and the haroset? Anybody that wants some can have some after the service. I will be making those for all comers. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to cover the front row. I think it's a rule. It's at least a tradition. And you know how us Jews are about our traditions. Okay. All right, here you go. There you go. You get a corner piece. There you go. There you go. And so everybody has to partake. And what a beautiful symbol that everyone has to receive the resurrected Christ. That the Alpha Komen comes back and everyone has to partake. Third cup. The third cup is the cup of redemption. Because in Exodus chapter 6, it says, I will redeem you with a stretched out hand and with great judgments. And they remember how God redeemed them, how God saved them and delivered them from Egypt with a stretched out arm and great judgments. And they remember that. They talk about that. They have the special prayer. And then everybody drinks the third cup. The men in the front row are helping me by drinking also the third cup. We appreciate your, 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 your help. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about the third cup. Because the third cup is the cup of redemption, as I just told you. Now, I told you at the beginning that there's an Agadah. There's a, there's a specific order. In fact, the word Seder means order. There's a specific order of, of procedure of how you do this. And the traditions have been going on. Do you realize, Pastor read it from Exodus, how God said on that day in Egypt... God said, you will celebrate this every year throughout all of your generations forever. And the Jewish people, with some exceptions, have been celebrating it ever since. That's 3,500 years. 3,500 years the Jewish people have been celebrating this. And many of the traditions, most of the traditions I'm telling you about tonight, have been in place literally for millennia, for thousands of years. Okay, so this has been going on a long time. But there was a particular day when the, the Passover feast was being celebrated, okay? Not too different than what we're doing today, although I'm guessing they had the lamb there and everything is because this was a long time ago. And, and so they were, they were celebrating the Passover feast, and, and the guy who was leading it, he got to this spot, to the third cup, to the cup of redemption, and he changed the tradition. He didn't say what he was supposed to say. He did something completely different, completely shocking, and blew everybody's mind. Because he took the third cup, and he filled it. But instead of saying what he usually said, it's recorded that he took the cup and give thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see, because 
when in the Gospels it talks about Jesus and the disciples in the upper room, they were doing the Passover Seder. And when he got to the third cup, the third cup of redemption, instead of following the usual procedure, he turned, Jesus who was leading it, turned to the 12, okay, by then 11, and he said to them, this cup, this wine, is my blood of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. Drink ye all of it. And every time that we in our church have the Lord's table and we celebrate the Lord's table, we're remembering that day when Jesus was celebrating the Passover Seder with his disciples in the upper room and got to the third cup, the third cup of redemption, and forever changed the meaning of this. Because before then, it meant that God redeemed us from Egypt. Exodus chapter 6, like we read. And then since that day, to those of us who know, this cup reminds us that not only did God redeem Egypt from Israel from Egypt back in the day, but this cup symbolizes the blood of Christ that was shed to redeem all of us from sin. The third cup of redemption. Now, did anybody notice that there's a chair over there? But there's nobody in it. And did you notice that there's a cup there? But nobody's drinking it. James, I'm going to need your help again. So this is Elijah's seat. Okay? Because in every Jewish home, on every Passover, there's always a place setting, a cup, a chair, that's set aside for Elijah. And it, and it remains empty, waiting for Elijah. And then at this point in this thing, the dad turns to one of his sons. And he says to his son, go and check and see if Elijah is coming. So James, run to the front door, open it, look outside, look to the left, look to the right. Find out if Elijah is coming and come back and report. Go fast. Okay? And so one of the sons is sent to do that. Now your church supports a man named Stan Skriloff, who's a missionary, missionary with IBJM and a dear friend of mine. Brother Stan grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home. And he, he, he told me, he said, my dad always asked me to be the one to go check to see if Elijah was there. I said, that's so cool. He said, no, it was horrible. I was scared to death. And I said, what were you scared of? He said, I was scared that Elijah would be there. Um... James, is Elijah there? He's not. Once again we wait. Thank you. Once again we wait. For thousands of years we're waiting for Messiah. You know, the, the Tanakh tells us that he's going to send Elijah before Messiah comes. And so we're expecting Elijah. We're waiting for Elijah because we know Elijah's going to come and the Messiah's going to come and he's going to deliver us all. And we wait and wait for Elijah. We wait and wait for Messiah. And year after year, our son goes to the door and looks. And year after year, he comes back. No Elijah. Messiah's not here. We'll have to wait again. And the Jewish people, every year, run to the door and look to see if Elijah's coming, if the forerunner of Messiah, maybe this is the year that Elijah will come, that Messiah will come. And then every year they're disappointed, not realizing that he came 2,000 years ago, and they've missed it. And it breaks my heart. They're looking, and in fact... They have a song that they sing called, uh, not a song, a prayer that they pray called Ani Mayamam, I believe. Many Orthodox Jews at this point recite the prayer of Maimonides, the great Middle Ages rabbi, and it goes like this. I believe with a perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and though he may tarry, nevertheless I will wait for him every day until he comes. And so they wait, and they continue to wait. They sing a song called Elijah the Prophet. Elijah the Prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Gileadite, may he come quickly in our days with the Messiah, the son of David. And they continue to wait. 
for the Messiah who came 2,000 years ago and they missed it. The question is, will you go and tell them the Messiah has come? Here's the fourth cup. The cup of acceptance. Because the verse in in Exodus 6-7 that that we've been reading it says, and I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. It reminds them that the day is going to, that, that God not only delivered them, but that he's accepted them, that he is, that they are his people, that he is their God. It reminds me of Romans eleven twenty six, where it says that a day is coming when it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And so the fourth cup is filled and they pray the prayer. They talk about how God has accepted them as his people. And they pray the prayers and they drink of the fourth cup. At this time, then, they, there's more, more praise psalm, psalms. Psalm 118, Psalm 126. When the Lord turned again the captivity of, Zion, captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And then they have a saying that they say. They say, Lashana next year in Jerusalem next year maybe Messiah will come next year maybe we will meet and celebrate the Passover with Messiah in Jerusalem and then this is something you're familiar with when Jesus and the disciples celebrated in the upper room what did they do at the end when they were done it said they went out singing singing hymns and that's what the Jewish people do then at the end of their Passover Seder They have special songs that they sing, and that concludes the Passover Seder. And we're essentially done now. Let me say in conclusion, it's a beautiful ceremony. But folks, the point is that these these dear people, God's chosen people, the people through whom we receive the word of God and Messiah, are lost. They're, they're worshiping in a religion that cannot save them. And they're, they're locked in darkness, not knowing the truth. And the only way, the only way that they can be one is if you and I, if God's church will say, we will lovingly take the gospel to them. I'm going to pray and I'm going to say, God, send me a Jewish soul. And when he does, what am I going to do? I'm going to love him. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to sow the word of God in his life. And I'm going to keep doing it for as long as it takes. And I beg of you tonight to make that commitment to say, God, I ask you to send me a Jewish soul. And I promise you that when you do, I will love him and pray for him and sow and stay at it for as long as it takes. Wow, that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? Um, I told you, you you wouldn't be disappointed in this, and uh, I saw him do this a couple years ago, and um, when we had the opportunity to get him to come up, I wanted to do it because, again, just every every piece of it shows, points to Jesus Christ, and yet, as he said, you know, these are God's people, and every year they do this. And they completely miss it. They completely miss what it's all about. And uh, I, hope, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you've learned some things. And just, again, seeing how even through, through all of it, it points back to Jesus Christ, what Christ has done for us. And uh, even to be able to, to share the gospel, to be able to witness to other Jews. And uh, aren't you glad that we're not having to wait every year hoping can you imagine that? I mean, every year, hoping, waiting. Well, maybe he's going to come. Hopefully, maybe next year. Hopefully, maybe next year. No, we know he's come. 
We know who our Messiah is, and if you put your faith and trust in him, we know where our home is. And uh, are we looking for him to return? Yes, absolutely. Um, but not to save us. We, we've already got that settled, amen? Uh, we're looking for him to come just so we can be with him for the rest, the rest of our lives, the rest of eternity. And uh, so uh, I appreciate Brother Wilson being here with us this week, and obviously I know he has such a burden uh, to reach Jewish people with the gospel. And uh, I know if you have any questions for him, he'd be happy to answer uh, any of those questions that you have tonight. Brady, make sure you don't leave with a shirt. Where's Brady at? Don't leave with a shirt. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we're so glad that you were here this evening. Those watching via live stream, I hope it was a blessing to you as well. And uh, it was great just to be able to be a part of that whole thing. Um, he sent me the song a couple weeks ago, and, um, and I thought, we're going to do it, you know. Um, and the problem was, after I listened to it, I could not get it out of my head, <laughs> you know. I'm driving in the car, die, die, ain't new, die, die, ain't. I'm like, I don't know the rest of it, but I got that part, right? <laughs> and um, so, but it was great, and uh, I sure appreciate Brother Wilson being with us. And so, uh, Brother Wilson, if you want to make your way to the back there, um, and uh, again, some of this stuff is up here, I would, you know, I don't know, Brother Wilson, would you rather stay up here by the table and if people have questions about it, or what would you rather do? You stay up here? Yeah, maybe stay up here. If you have a question about something up here, or I know he said if you want to, if you want to try something, maybe up here, you know. Um, but I'll, I'll let you kind of stick around up here if people want to ask you questions or whatever, or get, maybe get a little bit better view of some of these things. Um, Macaroons, and I'm making the matzo with the with with the bitter herbs and the charoset. So you're welcome to come and try that if you're if you're brave. All right, very good. I think you said there's only 12 macaroons, right? There's, there's, I think that's 12. 12. So the first row's already got something. So you guys are out. You guys got you got. They're like, no, no, no. <laughs> I think you're getting an argument here. <laughs> Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then if you'd like to come up and see some of this stuff a little bit better, uh, talk to Brother Wilson here, and uh, appreciate you being uh, patient tonight. I think it was worth it, amen, just to be able to learn some more of these things. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that we can come this evening, and uh, Lord, just thank you, uh, Lord, for your word and how as we study your word, um, Lord, it all points to you, it all points to Jesus. And uh, Father, just through this, that we just see even... Even through the Passover feast, Lord, the, the picture of Jesus Christ through it all. And I pray that you would give us a greater burden, uh, Lord, for the Jewish people. Uh, Lord, I, I know maybe in our area right here in Eaton, there may not be many, but Lord, in Richmond and Dayton, uh, we, we know they're there. And Lord, give us a burden for them and be able to reach out to them and uh, pray that you would bring them into our lives and so we might be able to witness to them. Uh, but Lord, even more importantly than that, that we would just be a witness to anyone that we come in contact with be able to share the gospel with them, because there are many uh, that do not know about Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, that they, they, don't, they don't know the gospel, and I pray you'd help us to have a greater burden for that. Thank you for Brother Wilson being with us this, this weekend, and uh, Lord, I know he's traveling tomorrow. Keep him safe on the road, and uh, just as, as he has a burden to reach the Jewish people and to help churches uh, to learn more and to be able to reach them, and uh, just watch over him and his wife and their ministry, Lord, and uh, just give us a, a blessed evening tonight. Thank you for your love, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.